Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Baseball presented by Diamond Digest. I am this week's host, Jordan Lazowski. Got another great crew for you on this week. Tavi, welcome back for a second week in the row after the trade deadline. And we've got two Sams this week. So <laughs> I'm sure that won't be confusing at all. Sam Hicks, Sam Hogan. And We're both Sam H. And you're both yeah, Sam, no, that's, that's and that's Sam H. Thing. You're new, but actually that doesn't help me anymore. <laughs> but let's just say to start the Sam H who is new. Why don't you introduce yourself to everybody since this is the first time appearing on a Diamond Diver podcast? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I've been a Rays fan my entire life. Um, avid, avid fan. Uh, I Some other baseball side things I do. A lot, um, I play out-of-the-park baseball. Very, I'm a big fan of that. Love out-of-the-park baseball. Um, and, yeah. I mean, if you want to know, like, some personal favorite little bits of mine, some memories over the year, definitely Evan Longoria was always – favorite player of mine i really really hope that he can make a return next year on the team because i'm noticing giants are probably going to decline that option and um he would fit perfectly on one last world series run with a race team that's that's all i'm hoping for but um favorite memory i would definitely have to put that brett phillips game six moment uh, sorry not game six game five it was game uh, four game four game fourth because i really did think that we would I thought we had the World Series after that. I did, you know. I wasn't all the momentum. I thought we had. I thought we had the World Series after that, but uh, no. But yeah, those are some of the key moments I put up there, and uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be here and doing this. Yeah, glad you could join us. I not to derail before we even start, but out of the park, I I have problems playing in more than like a week stint, and I get mm. mad at the game, and I don't know why. No, it definitely is like an on-off game that will yeah. frustrate you so much to where you're like, I can't play this anymore. And then I'll be like, oh, I want to rebuild this stick of it. And uh, I'm like grinding for two weeks again. It's it's such a cycle for me, but yeah. I, I do like that game. Just like casually, I like casually went 20 years with the A's without winning a World Series like in like three days once. Did you really? Oh, God. It's hard. It's hard that's, to play, but it's, I enjoy it. But anyway, Sam, welcome. Tavi, welcome back. Sam, other Sam, welcome back. Uh, series regular at this point, Sam Hicks. Can I get the role uh, on Discord? For Oh, yeah. We'll figure that one out. That's, that's not in my territory, but I'll make sure we take care of it. But anywho, welcome to this week's episode. Um, we got plenty to talk about this week. Um, last episode was the trade deadline, so now we're starting to see some of the fallout from that. We'll talk about the standings, some of the interesting races currently going on. Obviously going to have to talk about Fernando Tatis a little bit, Chris Sale, Jason Hayward, and a whole bunch of things going on this week. And let's just start where we always start with the standings update. So this is as of Sunday night during Sunday night baseball. Here's what the standings looks like. The standings look like in the AL East, the Yankees have a 10 game lead over the Toronto Blue Jays for first place. In the AL Central, the Cleveland Guardians are now in first place. This is new since the last time we were on the podcast. In the AL West, the Houston Astros enjoy a comfortable lead out there as well. In the National League, in the East, the New York Mets enjoy a decently sized lead, five and a half over the Braves, who are surging. They've won six in a row. The, the NL Central, the Cardinals have a slight lead over the Brewers. And the Dodgers remain the Dodgers in the NL West. No surprises here. Once Soto didn't change everything drastically for the Padres, um, they sit 16 games back of the Dodgers. Currently. I mean, he'll make sure they make it. Yeah, he helps ensure they make it. I agree, but you're not catching them. Um, and... You're certainly not getting the Super Three anymore over there. Just no, see Soto Machado. And well, that's going to come anytime soon. But. Yeah. Um, one thing I do want to talk about and at least start off with is, you know, we're getting close to um, the time of year where we start kind of looking at the standings again, where first couple of weeks we kind of look at them. And then all of these episodes, we really don't look at the standings at all. And now we're getting to the point where we're mid August, we're heading towards the end of the dog days of August. Now we're starting to talk about the standings again. And I, I, I think at current you're probably in the place where 
the AL wild card race, believe it or not, probably wouldn't have been predicted this way to start the season. Is probably one of the more interesting things at this point. So you have Toronto, Seattle, and Tampa Bay are your top three there. Just a game and a half out, the Baltimore Orioles, and two games back of them, both the Minnesota Twins and Chicago White Sox. Some teams that you probably expected to be in the hunt for their um, their, their pennant within the division. But honestly, this this is a weird one. Boston's four and a half back there. They're really I think Boston really are still off. in it a bit. I think yeah, Boston Boston's four still and a half can. back. They they so get hot. They can make a run. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of where yeah. your cutoff is because after that, the the Rangers are nine and a half back. So you're that's kind of where the cutoff comes. Yeah, we've got some interesting things that are likely to come. And I mean, no team's really established itself in, in that category. The, the Blue Jays only enjoy a one game lead over Seattle at that point. It's- I'm noticing with the Blue Jays, especially is they would be the first team I'd expect to just like take off from that pack, you know, make a run at even maybe catching the Yankees. I don't know. That's, that's a bit of a question mark. If any team catches the Yankees at this point, I think it can be done. That 10-game lead is definitely not as strong-looking as it was a couple a couple weeks ago. I mean, they're kind of stacking up injuries now. And that Jordan Montgomery trade, he's looking pretty good in St. Louis. So I think that they're showing weaker spots, but the, the Rays are going into series to play them. Uh, they got a tough schedule, the Yankees coming up. So... And because they're playing Toronto right after the Rays. So it's definitely going to be interesting to see if Toronto or Tampa Bay, they're more of a long shot, can actually catch the Yankees. But right now, that AL wildcard scene is very set, and I don't see it moving beyond that. I I think that it's going to be every team in that pack as it is right now. It's the intrigue of the third spot. Mm -hmm. Because I think if we don't, if it's only two spots, like last year, it's, okay, cool, Toronto and Seattle are making it unless one of them chokes like at this point we're like okay those two are kind of just the team they're the most talented they have and they are already in position but then with that third spot you're like okay can the Rays make it the Orioles even it's like I think that's why they like the third wildcard spot I think is a positive because it like lets all these like middling teams be like we're just one run we're just one stretch of good games away yeah well I'm, I'm looking at uh a tankathon there's a couple different uh people who rate remaining strength of schedule coming up right and tampa bay and oakland and baltimore and all of these teams that you're talking about have some of the absolute toughest opponents coming up so uh what for whatever that means you you know teams get hot teams cool down all that sort of thing i don't i don't know it feels like there's such a separation of teams this year that it feels really hard it's really hard to pinpoint like which which division is going to get unseated. I think it's it, but I know you're talking about like wild card spots and things like that. But um, it's the the schedule this year, like as a different topic, has been really strange. Uh, mm-hmm. The NL West is very incestuous at the end of the year. Like they're only playing each other with like uh, I think we have like two Brewers seasons and maybe like a Miami. Uh, um, I'm sorry, two Brewers. Series. Uh, series. Right. Thank you. Very tired. Uh, and then, like, I think we play the the the, 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 I almost said the Dolphins. I'm so tired. The Marlins football. No, stop. Football. It's not fall yet. Stop. Yeah, we're getting um, there, but not yet. Well, we're getting there. You can't have me yet. Um, but, you know, I, I, so that's part of the discussion, right? Is like teams getting hot also depends on who they're playing. And uh, several of the teams that you mentioned had like, according to this one website, were like top 10 most difficult schedules coming up. So maybe, you know, may, maybe not. I, I don't know. Uh, number one, however, is, uh, is, is, is uh, two NL West teams, Arizona and Colorado, followed by Miami, Tampa, Tampa Bay, Pittsburgh, Washington, Oakland, Baltimore, San Francisco. That's the top, the top ten according to Tankathon. I'm not sure Tampa how Bay's got their work cut out for them. Yeah. So, so yeah. you know, it's 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 possible, but like the the schedule has just been really really weird this year. Um, at least it, it is for the NL West. I don't know what it's like in other divisions, but there you go. And I think one thing that's interesting about Toronto too is. They haven't played well as of late, and it and it's been against teams like you probably should be beating. 
or at least making it close. Like the twins aren't great. They split a series there. They didn't look great in that split either. Like Minnesota probably could have taken at least three or four there. Now you have Baltimore, New York, Boston coming up. Like you got to take care of your division now at this point, if you want to stay in the wild card at, at the same time, so it's like, that's an interesting team too. And especially if they're there with the Rays who were according to Tankathon, like you said to be one of the teams that, has the hardest run schedule remaining. Now it's like, all right, maybe Seattle really gets an easy play in. And and does Baltimore somehow sneak into this? If they're able to just literally tread water, just beat these teams that they feel like you sh- they shouldn't be beating right now. They beat them. One thing I feel that Baltimore have is like they have, it was like what I noticed with Seattle last year. Like they have the nation behind them. They've got everyone rooting for them, which I think is going to play up for them because they're kind of everybody wants them in, you know? They, they've they been tanking for years. They've been awful these past years. We want to see a good Baltimore team. I'm a Rays fan. I've been loving watching this great Baltimore team. It's been so exciting. They're such a fun team. I would want to see them make a run, even if maybe it's at the expense of my own team. I don't know. But still, that team is really fun, and I am excited for them to be playing postseason caliber baseball come september deep in the deep into september here's my thing with the orioles they have no star power like at all no outside from maybe like adley but he's like he's like he's like good he's not like superstar yet they are a team like built on like that money ball idea of like building players in the aggregate of hey, their bullpen's been great at that their bullpen's yeah. been elite this year it's like don't like you don't need three superstars. You need seven guys who can OPS plus above a hundred. And you know what I'm impressed with Baltimore is that they've done so much of this with guys that aren't outside of the system. Cause that whole money ball idea was adding guys that were kind of slept on because of their on base and teams not valuing that Baltimore have done a great job of finding talent within their system and bringing them up and transitioning them super well. Felix Bautista, Brian Baker, all these arms in the bullpen who you've never heard of, these are all rookies in second years that are making such a good transition, and they're making that young Baltimore team really, really talented. I mean, the bats now, you're seeing it as well. That Taron Vavra, I think is his name. He's been on a tear ever since he's come up. Yeah, he's been good. Yeah. I mean, you also have to consider the fact that look at how all these guys were acquired. Like, I can count the number of, like, first-round pick like high, highly touted guys on one hand. If these, like Cedric Mullins was taken in the 13th, they're international guys who signed for like like 50K or something. Mm-hmm. It's like, they've been playing, they've been doing, they've been running their organization smartly for years. I mean, I also hate to say it, but tanking is going to get you talent. All right, people hate tanking. Yeah. I hate tanking. Tanking is, it doesn't make baseball fun for anyone. You know, the fans hate it. But it will acquire you high level talent with the old system. I mean, I think it, it got them like guaranteed. It got them Rutschman, and they got them Grayson Rodriguez, Gunnar mm-hmm. Henderson, and Gunnar Henderson, I guess. But he was he he was a supplemental first, right? Yeah, yeah. So they could probably get him anyway. Uh, but like you get those guys, but it's the supporting cast that makes them good right now. It is. This yeah. team is not the result of a tech. It's the result of smart organizational management and just be being willing to win again. So you look at it. Let's just let's make a prediction here. Who are the top three that come out of the AL wild card? Ooh. Who are those three that end up in a battle of what? Seven teams that realistically have a chance. Who are your three? And you can throw Cleveland in there too, because technically the division for them isn't getting. It could, it could I feel swap like, easily. I feel like the Yankees are probably winning that division, and I feel okay. like the Astros are probably winning that division. Uh, I think token AL Central team that gets second isn't going to make it. So, I would agree with that. I yeah. think it's one AL Central team, and that's it. Yeah. Can I just tell you how much I don't care about the AL Central? Like I, I'm this looking at these teams. Division, I, we barely play them. I, I know. Look, look. Go I, ahead, I, 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 I just like I'm looking at them and I like. You know, I'm kind of glad the Guardians are having a good year. Uh, I'm not. I, I you well, know, the I White swear, Sox I checked the scores for the day, you know, and like, I see I just, like. 
three AL Central games slated. I don't care. I'm not gonna watch. Well, that. I care. I care today because the Royals played the Dodgers. But I'm like, I, I just, I, I don't know. I, it's, it's historically not good. Um, and you know, you talk about tanking. I felt like the whole league was tanking there for a while. And so, like, if one of them makes it into the wild card not start, convinced they are. Awesome. If one of them makes it in, awesome. That's great. If not, like, I just, I don't know. Like, I, I, I wanted to watch the White Sox last year because they had a lot of talent, but Tony Larusa just like, you know, I don't. Don't get him started. Don't get him wreck. started. Preach to the choir. Preach don't get him started. Right. <laughs> train wreck. So I honestly like until someone's. It's not that I hate the AL Central. It's just that I, I have. It's like the you know if the opposite of love is indifference. And pretty indifferent like i hate the al central for <laughs> i hate the nl central personally well, i mean I the central so. leagues are historically not as fun Fair. let's just put it that yeah, way they're just not quite there's as no there's no money in the middle of the country wait are we counting the white Sox out of the wild card race yeah so yeah. going down to boston <laughs> i wouldn't listen they're in it you have to either say they're going to win their division or in it. i think I mean, that they're in it I, There's I two think, and a half okay, my, back right now. My thing is, is that team just has too much talent not to make some type of run or have some type of stretch down the line. Because I just think that so much injury stuff has hit them hard this year. I know Tim Anderson now. Mm-hmm. That was a really tough loss. That's what I really think made people kind of set them off and just kind of cast them away now for the year is ever since that TA injury news. But they're they're just a team that I'm I'm not counting out at all yet. They're like the Red Sox. I mean, I'm, here's I'm the, my thing with the White Sox is that they're built to win in the postseason. Mm-hmm. They just have to get there. Yeah, I just don't think they can manage it with a with a dinosaur managing them. Yeah, no pun intended. The joys of my life, <laughs> truly, truly the joys of my life. I don't know. It's a team we've seen underachieve all season, and it's hard to say. It's like you're waiting for that stretch of them to finally put it all together for the year. I was encouraged by Lance Lynn today. That was something. He yeah, was it's like they're moving looking. in the right direction. They are. Now you gotta now you gotta not go get swept by Houston. And right after that you can play Cleveland. So they yeah. they would have been better off be with the season maybe, right there. They would have been better off with Dane Dunning, just keeping him around. No, oh, just God, keep God. Dane. Keep Dane Dunning. I I was okay with the Lynn trade. Um. Okay, but predictions. Who are your ta- Who are your three teams that come out of the AO wild card? Who's going Ooh. first? Ooh. Sam. Uh, I would love to go first. He can oh. go first. I'll go first. Sam. Go right I would ahead. love to. I, I already have it in mind. Perfect. Blue Jays are an easy lock. I'm putting them okay. easy lock. They're they're gonna make it. Um. Otherwise, beyond there, I have got the Rays. Not making it. I hate to say that about my own team, but way to be unbiased. God, I respect it. <laughs> I, I I have to make myself so unbiased to say that. But <laughs> the Rays are just. I I don't think they have what it takes. What maybe makes me change my mind later on is if Wander returns sooner than expected. Uh, I know Nick Anderson is close to returning. We've got a lot of guys, Yanni Torinos, who are on the on the horizon. But otherwise, the strength of the schedule really freaks me out. Going into the Bronx these next three days is really going to make or break them. They have to play the Jays right after that. They've just got such a tough stretch to end the year. And then to finish the year off, they're playing Houston, two series against Houston to finish the year. That that puts no faith in me. I'm sorry. That's uh, that's just a brutal are we, stretch. Are we going to say that he, I feel like Houston might like take it easy for that last couple series when they've already clinched? I hope, but I don't think they will. Even I Houston think, going easy, I think, could still outmatch them. Right. I mean, yeah, Houston's yeah. so good. And yeah. that third team that I have. Um, you didn't name the second one. You said the Rays were out. You yeah, said- yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I've, I've only done Toronto as being in. Seattle, and I have the Guardians. Okay. I have Minnesota kind of going on a surge again and reclaiming that. I think it's going to be Seattle and Cleveland to finish off two and three. Uh, I don't. I no fault to the Guardians, but I think that they're gonna a playoff spot would be would be great for them. I think you know. I hate the Guardians. Like they're 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 the brand of baseball that's so like anti twenty twenty two that you. Oh, can't I kind of like them. I think I love them. You can't game plan for it. It's it's like 
and I'm speaking from a from White Sox fan perspective. Everyone's like, oh, I hate the Twins. I hate them. I'm like, I hate the Guardians. <laughs> I mean, you can game plan for the Twins. They're a typical 2020 style offense. The Guardians are not. They are not a team that is, that is built in a way that is stereotypically supposed to win in 2022. And contact and defense. Watch them play. defense. Contact and defense. Built defense. on contact and defense. Quan, Miles Straw, Ahmed Rosario, all these guys. Andre Jimenez. Yeah, it's a they're wild just like, team to watch. They're they're kind of like secondary star names, but like mm-hmm. God, combine that with Jose Ramirez, you've got a potent enough offense with that pitching staff. Tristan McKenzie, right. Shane Bieber, ooh, that's a nasty team. And Cal Quantrill for that for, to mop up a series. Yeah, Cal Quantrill. <laughs> eh, well, Sam, your prediction or other Sam, your predictions. All right, I'm gonna agree. Blue Jays, Mariners in. I need Baltimore in the postseason. So they're the third team. Someone had to say it. Fair enough. Tell I me. love I love their okay. brand of just they're an OOTP team in <laughs> real life. They are. It's like, hey, what if we take what if we get all the bullpen people and the rotation's mediocre? And the offense is just okay. And we'll make the third wild card. <laughs> they're the chaos team. Yeah. They Nothing really wrong are. with that. Like, yeah. even if they're like, even if they lose ten in a row, they're and they're out of it. I don't want to be facing the last series of the season. Mm-hmm. No. no, I completely agree with that. They would be the single greatest spoiler team in MLB history. They already are a spoiler team. Yeah. <laughs> but Tavi, what about you? At Mariners, uh, I they have one more win, the Guardians and the uh, Blue Jays right now. They have the easiest schedule coming up, according to several uh, websites. I think they're a fun team. Um, I think that uh, game recently that went into, what, 8,000 innings was a lot of fun. And it had all of baseball watching, and, and they're an interesting team. Uh, I paid attention a little bit to them last year because of uh, – before Casey Sadler. Casey Sadler's, like, one of my favorite just, like, kind of travel – he was a Dodger for a while. He's been all over. Uh, he's yeah. on, he's injured, I, still, I think, still. Um, but he was lights out for them, and it was really fun to watch him thrive. Um, you know – People like there's a there's a there's a you know the come to the Dodgers and we'll fix you. Well, we don't really do that to every single player because not every player fits in and you know different styles work with different people. It was really great to see Casey see that, and I kind of started watching more Mariners baseball, and they're they're fun mm-hmm. um, and you know better records than the Blue Jays and the Guardians right now. As for two and three, I I don't know I I I, I don't again. I don't. <laughs> I, 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 I have you watch non Dodger baseball challenge. Hey, I watch an OS baseball. Thank you. <laughs> um, I can tell you way more about the, the, I can tell you more about Christian Walker than you'd probably ever want to know. Um, he's on the, anyway, but, uh, it's so only yeah, like Geraldo it, Perdomo. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I just, I don't, I mean, you know, there's baseball so big and you can, I, I personally just, I only have so much room in my brain for stuff. I like seeing teams when they do well. I, I don't care. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll take it. You're an AL or an NL West specialist. Huh? Fine by me. I, I like what I like and I, it's watching, you know, sometimes five day, five games a day is, is enough. So fair enough. <laughs> but let's get to the NL West anyway, because we're about 20 minutes in and we still haven't talked about the fact that Manny Machado got popped for PEDs and made quite possibly. Tatis. Manny Machado is Tatis. Did I say Manny Machado? You, you did. did. Fernando Tatis. Yeah, Fernando Tatis got popped for PEDs. And can they, I can I talk about how hilarious it was that they like Googled it and spelled it wrong? And yes, that oh my god, yeah, really really? talk about. I I don't know. Look, this is this is the theory oh, that I'm god. rolling with, right? It's, I don't know for a it's fact. It's a completely logical theory. It's a completely different drug, but they sound very similar. And I bet you somebody Googled it and spelled it wrong and saw a ringworm, and they're like, yeah, that. Because then supposedly. Tatis's mom posted that photo of him having ringworm on his neck. Well, I don't know if you guys know why it's called ringworm, 
because it forms in a ring. There's no worm involved. I mean, it's it a fungus. It wasn't that, a ring. <laughs> it, there was nothing ring about it. And like, no maybe, ring. yes, maybe it was a fungus. Maybe it wasn't specifically uh, ringworm and that got blown. But like, it just, it just, just, I'm it's just, it's just, at least draw a circle around it and like, you know, concealer or something and like try Fern you know i don't know i don't know billy i've seen a lot of ringworm that didn't look like ringworm to me uh, fernando tessis jr and you know, his dad fernando tessis senior wants more steroids in the game he brought him in in the 90s he's bringing him back just i think it's really gross though how the team has really thrown him under the bus i was that's the other Whoa. big story the first one is that yes someone clearly made up so I I think it's clear as day that someone made up the ringworm excuse. Like that's yeah. just it, it's an anabolic steroid that has nothing to do with uh, ringworm. And you messed up, and you should fire whoever helped you put the statement out. The second piece of that is if you look at the statements from um, both Prowler on Tatis, as well as Thank Clevenger, you, and I forget who the Clevenger, was. but yeah, yeah. Dude, Clevenger, Clevenger has a lot of balls. A lot of nerve being that nice. being that guy on the Cleveland squad in 2020. Yeah, yeah. Who who let Plezak take the fall for like a uh, several days? Traveled with the team, and then I was like, by the way, oh yeah, I only got caught up because of like social media. Like there's a photo of him or something. Mm -hmm. So first of all, shut up, Clevenger. You have no right to talk about <laughs> trust issues and a team. Like, come on. And there's also, I mean, there's, I, 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 we're probably not the right group to have this discussion, but there is a larger discussion to be had about when players of color are called out for things like this and the maturity issues and trustworthiness and like the language that he's used to talk about these players. Again, we're all pretty pasty pale here. So I think we're not going to get deep into that, but there are many writers out there who are writing about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Curly Fro writes about it. Uh, it is just it's worth it's worth looking at when you're talking about these decisions and all the players that have spoken out against him barring Manny Machado have been pretty pale so um it definitely puts the Machado Tatis blow up in the clubhouse mm -hmm. last season in a little bit different perspective um that's not to say that he wasn't like, Tatis wasn't a bit of an idiot and took a drug that he knew he shouldn't have that that's not to excuse the behavior but it is a little gross how quickly they are just absolutely separating themselves from no, no, no. You know, there's this, there's some sort of communication. It's, just, it's wild how they're doing it, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, well, how, they have Soto now. How quickly the team reacted to, like, and it's in most cases, it's like, when you've seen guys get, uh, I remember Wellington, was it Wellington? It was Wellington Castillo. When he got Beef. PEDs with the White Sox. Yeah, and it was kind of like, oh yeah, it, it happened. He's fine. Where it was just, it was very like, yeah, it's whatever type thing. And Castillo's not. It wasn't like a star player by any sense of the word. So it was like, yeah, whatever. They got kind of just like brushing it aside. You would expect, like, when it happens to a stud player, for them to take a similar route, where it's like, yeah, he he made a mistake. It's all right. We're gonna we're gonna learn to move past it. Nobody did that from his GM down to Machado and everyone in between. He really got. Yeah, I this, think that's it's, it's, okay. What, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. This is a this is this, Fernando Tatis Jr. would be fresh out of college, probably. Do you really trusting a guy who's like if he wasn't playing professional baseball, would probably be like me, like. This is a very young person who doesn't have does, a frontal lobe yet. It does speak to a larger thing about just the general age of the player. I agree with what you're saying. Um, but also, you have to understand, you know, once you enter into that realm, you essentially take on a lot more responsibility. How old is he? 23, 24? He's 23. He's... So you take on a lot more responsibility than your typical 23 year old. When you're handed oh, yeah. a check for $340 million, you understand your life is going to be a little bit different, especially when it's the GM. Like I just handed you a check for $340 million. Do they also, trade him? Do they trade happens. him? Do they trade There's him? A lot of veterans on the team who are trying to take their last crack at winning championships, right? stuff like that. They are playing their balls off. Sorry to use the word. I don't know. That's the first thing that came to mind. They're well, they're 
they're, they're playing so hard for that last try and get a chip. And I think stuff like this, if you are kind of a veteran and they're chasing a ring, it irks you to hear that your star player who is so close to returning is now just gone. That's fine and all, but I don't understand from, from a business perspective why they're doing this. Oh, because oh, whatever, oh, I agree. Completely. Whatever happens from behind closed doors, like maybe, you know, I again, I don't know Tatis. Maybe he is a bit of an idiot. The motorcycle stuff is sketchy. I can understand the resentment. I can understand the tensions inside the locker room. I don't understand why with this big of a contract hanging over them, they're going out there and talking about him being untrustworthy. I completely because, agree. Because, again, it, like, who's going to trade for him? You know, like any uh, team in the league, his value's at its lowest. They're mm. well, why then, then, then why are they digging the hole? Right, like, but why are, to your point, if, like if it's your value is a smart move. His, yeah. It's not a smart move, but also like I, I do agree who's gonna want to trade for someone who yeah. you can't trade. It's kind of like and we'll get to Chris Sale in a little bit. It's kind of a very similar situation. A guy with a gigantic contract in Tatis. You can't trust that he's going to make decisions that warrant his or, or that are allowing him to stay on the field peds the biking whatever biking things are going like a lot of things are happening and again it maybe it's unfair for a 23 year old but 340 million dollars says you're going to probably see a different life than a typical 23 okay, year old so and know what you're signing up if, for. if this were if this were like a star like football player just i would say send him to pittsburgh mike tomlin will fix him Who's the dis disciplinary guru of MLB? But it's 162 games. Like it is a long season to go mm -hmm. through this. Like yeah. that's the difference. I just I yeah. feel I feel bad for him. I feel like he's I had do. Some, I, I feel like he's had some lack of maybe. I I mean some people are you can't help. Like some people you can't get through to them. You they, right. they're they're gonna do what they're gonna do what they're gonna do. Um, but I do I do wish that there was maybe someone in his life who you know, smacked it out of his hand and said, don't do that. There's thir you know, there's millions of dollars on the line. Um, I, the whole situation sad. Um, and I wish it hadn't happened. Um, it is the most Padres thing to ever Padres though. Like yeah. it's that's the Dodgers fan eventually coming out at the end. <laughs> it really is. It really is. And I have to say this, I don't envy Bob Melvin his job right now because just what a what a what a span of two weeks, right? Like you you trade for Juan Soto and then you lose your other Ooh, star. Okay. I, I honestly I'm sad that they're not gonna be on the team because if there's any player who understands what it is to be a young and successful player of color. Mm -hmm with enormous pressure of, a, of an entire franchise on him, it's Juan Soto. And everything I've ever seen from Juan Soto, be it interviews or just the way he interacts, he seems to have a really good grasp on who he is as a person, as mm -hmm. a ball player. And I feel like Tatis could have really benefited from that. And that's just, yeah. that's yeah. not good. I mean, I don't know if they, they may have talked personally. I don't know how, I don't know how interactive they are now that they're not in the team together, but I just, I mean, wouldn't you have loved to sit on, like be a fly on the wall on a conversation between Juan Soto and Fernando Tatis? Right. Like just saying Juan Soto has great discipline on and off the field. Yeah. And I, I think, oh you know, God. not that it's his job to fix <laughs> a player or to fix a co like, you know, it's yeah. never a coworker's job to fix another coworker. Right. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that I, I don't, I regret the, the fact that they're not going to be able to play next to each other for a while because yeah. i think i think they both had a lot to maybe learn from each other maybe tati's a little more when it comes to attitude and stuff but like I will, if there's a man yeah. if there's a manager who can get his team through this situation it's bob melvin right that was a great hire that was a great hire by the like, if, like I, I forget who like was like jace that one like jace tingler, jace tingler. i think do you think was... he deals with this well he he didn't even like i it. it's possible he's part of the reason why the situation is happening like if he if it, I, I i don't this may be really unfair to him but like he did i mean there was a public fight in his in his dugout mm -hmm. um again you can only have so much control or influence over another human being maybe that happens no matter who the manager is but he certainly he certainly was a scapegoat for it let's just put it that way i think uh Nine minutes of Fernando Tatis discussion is probably enough. <laughs> Sam, are you running this show now, or yes, yeah, they they put me in charge. Sam, what do you want to talk about next? You want to go to the Field of Dreams since your team was involved? Uh, my team lost in the Field of yes, Dreams. Yes, your team lost, and that's exactly why I'm going to bring it up. Exactly, but Chicago owns the Field now of Dreams. Now we're even. Apparently. 
Um, I don't know. Should we, should we talk about um, the obvious like elephant in the room with that game of why those two teams were picked to play such? That's a exactly what I was going to ask. My, yeah. my, 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 my point was going to be. I mean, you know, a sing, not a single home run was hit the entire game. I, they forgot the juice balls. I don't know what yeah. happened. There. Yeah. It, it was it was a curious pick for those two teams, and they came out and said the Field of Dreams isn't going to go, or they're not going to go back to the Field of Dreams next year. Well, they can't. They sold the facility. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's not something that's going to be happening moving forward. So it begs the question, well, if you were only going to do it for two years, you got a great first game with two competing teams. And the second year you chose to pick two non-competing teams. Just move it to the sand lot. I'd be down for that. That'd be fun. That'd be fun. It's, it's funny about that facility, though. Um, I kind of got... Uh, this is okay. Sorry, this is a long involved story. So there was a Field of Dreams TV show in development mm-hmm. that uh, was supposed to go through Peacock that we were working on that got paused and probably won't happen again. Probably 2024 is the earliest it'll be released. But uh, there was lots of crew discussion about why they weren't shooting at the Field of Dreams site because it's still there. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, dug into that and I watched two different press conferences uh, about this site and like major league baseball mlb was so conspicuously absent i wonder if there's a little bit of like tension there um like usually you at least acknowledge anyone who's involved like conspicuously absent it's going to be a youth travel ball center and on one hand the facility sounds really cool but they're building like youth dormitories which just is, feels like everything that's wrong with youth travel ball like oh yeah yeah so expensive it's so it's going to be expensive they're building like a hotel and like all this stuff and it just i don't know this is maybe a different discussion about what's happening in in youth baseball but like on one hand, it's going to be a really cool facility. On the other hand, God, it sounds like baseball factory camp. And it just, it's really weird. But Major League Baseball is very conspicuously not involved in it. As to why they chose these two teams, I, I don't know, dartboard schedule. It's not like they put a lot of thought into the schedule this year anyway. <laughs> so maybe they, I honestly, they were probably looking at the uniforms. Who has the coolest throwback uniforms? Yeah. Giants and know. Dodgers. Right? Not them. <laughs> But I I don't know. I that whole that whole the whole Field of Dreams game was so weird. Like I, I don't know if you remember last year where Kevin Costner just like wandered around wondering that what was, to do with his sunglasses. That was really weird. It was like old man forgets to hand sunglasses to PA for two and a half minutes. And then did you see all the did you see all the commentators dressed up in like in the the like nineteen twenties fits with like I think that's old, great. I, 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 I stopped there. Get the twenties. Just like, the whole thing was so much different. It, I, yeah. It's good for for adding you know kind of something different from the usual routine in an entire 162 game season okay i say if we're gonna if we're really going 1920s we got to bring in polio really add to that vibe yeah you know sure. what great you idea know, only like half of them get gloves do like the fingerless gloves so we can oh yeah, yeah. Like, we can supply there it. you go have but, the umpires dress how they used to the big balloons oh yeah, yeah we have all those um <laughs> But just as a side note, like I, I hope the Field of Dreams TV show goes because uh, uh, it's 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 Mike Schur who did The Good Place and Parks and Rec and all the good movies lately. So here's to hoping that gets going, but it won't be filmed at the Film of Dreams. So yeah, I think maybe baseball's distancing itself from it a little bit. It's mm-hmm. a weird property. The movie itself is not licensed by MLB, and I'm sure they are charging them out the ass to use field of dreams um, right. because that's just what Hollywood does. And as cool as it was, it, it kind of ran its course. Um, yeah. yeah. Really do it so many times. Let's, let's be honest. If you're going to put in two non-competing teams, you're running your course a little bit faster than you probably yeah. expect. Okay. In all fairness, but they're they going to be moving towards the games in London next year. So, so they're, they're probably exploring other projects at this point. So I, I get it. It was a nice change up from, and it was a nice change. As yeah. long as you continue to do some sort of change of pace every once in a while, I think that's a good idea. Uh, the overseas games are so detrimental sometimes to teams, though. But yeah, I agreed. But you know, I, I do want to say your youth baseball comment is not complete because of something I did write down that I wanted to get quick opinions on. Yeah. Um, and apparently it was a controver- more controversial than I thought it was going to be. Um, the kid who got hit and then went up and like, I don't know if y'all saw that. A kid, Little League World Series is going on. Yeah. That's why it's oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, that was a beautiful moment. in the head. Um, goes to first, tries to tell the the, the kid, um, for, and on Ma, who's like truly upset, he just hit it in the head. I get it. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, it's all good. It goes up. The kid gives him a hug. They have a good moment. Um, some people, are, some hardcore people, well, are some like, people are assholes. So, I have some hardcore okay. people like, are like, oh, you can't be doing that. I'm like, what's they're they're a left. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and uh, if I hit a kid when I was eleven, I'd probably cry. <laughs> right. If you have problems with another kid saying, "Hey, it's okay, I'm fine," what 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 hurt you? Like, you oh want to? You want That's such an asshole then, move? Yeah. If from a competitive standpoint, you want to be people at their best, right? Like that, that's my theory on it. Like I always, I always just call them the baseball old heads who are so obsessed about like that type of we need to keep playing the game. We don't care what's going on. <laughs> Emotions okay. are stupid. Wow. Why can like also like larger discussion about Little League World Series? Why are why can you place bets on it? That is. Unethical. I did not know you, you can do that. That, that is unethical. That's I'm so messed up. <gasps> That's wild. I did not know that until just now. You can like, <laughs> they, and they have like lines, like they have like the, I think they have like spreads and everything. We've gone too far. <laughs> Jeez. We uh, found the line and we crossed it real fast. Uh, that's wild. Yeah, this guy on TikTok, I was someone was like talking about, oh, like, yeah, you can just bribe one of the kids to throw a game for like twenty bucks. Yeah, they're like twelve. <laughs> they would. Yeah. <laughs> A couple bucks, honestly, that was all would take at that age. Geez, that's sad. Somebody asked me when I was 12 to throw a game for a lolly. I'd be like, dude, I'm not that good. I, you yeah. can try. I'll try. <laughs> Any candy, I'll do it, sure. Oh, that's sad. You know, it, it, it kind of puts like Tatis's attitude. I, I don't know how long he's been in baseball, but like it kind of puts young players' attitudes of like, Fuck it, I'm I'm gonna do what I want to do. Maybe a little yeah. in perspective, <laughs> if the pressure is on them for that long, that is that is absolutely. And the pressure's bad. Like the pressure at this mm. age has gotten real bad. Um, I mean, I competed a lot in my youth. I was I was I I don't look it now, but I was much more buff when I was a kid. Um, and I competed at like a national level in several different disciplines, and it just like it. It, it was immense and it feels like it's gotten worse and not better. And that's really, yeah. really disappointing. Like I, we, so I, this is really dumb, but like I, we, I had, I had a horse, like I did horse stuff too. And like someone tried to give my horse like a thing that would help make him fail a test. And I was 15. Um, the pressure on youth sports is just absolutely absolutely insane and that's why like when i brought up that field of dreams complex it actually like on one hand it's really cool and we need more facilities like that but on the other hand it feels so gate kept and so price pointed Mm -hmm. and so like if they're gonna go there for like a week that's kind of cool that's baseball summer camp cool but like just the idea of youth dormitories in the middle of fuck nowhere iowa is i don't know there's something unsettling about it yeah, no, it becomes the whole rich kids get to go there and the others are left behind. I, oh, I yeah, that. and it's like all of those oh, youth kids... baseball kind of is now with all the trends. It is. Oh, it is. Little... I played youth baseball in SoCal from when I was a little kid to high school level. It is it is brutal with just, like, how competitive. And there's a lot of it. That's I, I quit once I got to, like, ninth grade just because I couldn't go on anymore. The stuff becomes so absurdly expensive. The cost to play in high school in like the Rio Honda league or wherever you're playing, it just, everything becomes so expensive. It's not sustainable. You can't, you can't do that. Yeah. I don't know. I and mean, yeah, and the issue too. is like all those little league world series kids, that's rec ball. Yeah. Though that's not the travel kids. Like that's like, like all these kids, like these are the kids who are like, you know, playing like affordable baseball. <laughs> Yeah. And they're still finding ways to exploit them. Exactly. And they're still, like, being bet on, essentially. Yeah, so, like, it, and it's frustrating to see how that's kind of changed things. Well, well and also, it, it, into this. <laughs> this, the, 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 so I have a cousin who was on track to um, go to the Olympics in gymnastics. And the things that she did altered her body forever. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know what kids are doing. I mean, gymnastics is more dramatic when it comes to the way it changes your body. But, like... You know, I, I, I don't know what lasting impact this is going to have on kids mentally and physically. Like, it's yeah. just, it's pretty messed up. It's, it's that is I love baseball. <laughs> yeah. 
I love baseball. I, 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 there's, I know there's, there's still a love of baseball, and I hope the kids are able to retain that through, you know, dudes putting prop bets on their – just that's messed up. And, like, you think about, like, the best players, like, in MLB right now. They're largely those travel ball kids and the kids of former major leaguers. That's You're seeing or such both. a rise in that, by the way. And, and then, Japan, and then like, it's the Japanese guys – I don't know what baseball culture is like over there with like weather and then like with like Otani and whatnot. Then you have guys like Guerrero Jr. Bichette, who are like the kids of former major leaguers. And then you have the travel ball. And then you have the travel ball guys like, you know, your Machado, your your Machados, your Seegers, your Harpers. And the only real exception I can think of is Mike Trout. Yeah. Because he just played for Millville High School as far as I know. Kind of nice to have them like, just sneak their way through and don't really. It's like, yeah. where's like, there's such a lack of like American, American baseball talent that wasn't just born obscenely rich. Mm, yeah. It's it's weird how youth baseball has changed, and, and I, yeah, I, I I see it in coaching, and I've seen it just in, in how it changed from even me to my brother. Like, we're four years apart. Little league baseball was normal to play for me four years later it was not normal to play at all like he was on travel teams he wasn't playing little league baseball anymore once you and, once you get to travel really ball, work. man oh it becomes so unfun it just dips down i'll tell you that much well there's also i mean i know when jeff Passon put out his book the arm like the whole idea of youth pitchers like planning when when they're going to get their tommy john not if not maybe like when oh, yeah. they're going to get their tj and that's just that's really messed up <laughs> yeah, it is and you know before we talk about some other major league topics too i do <laughs> want to mention um as peyton has <coughs> excuse me reminded me he wrote an article i can't remember how long ago but it was on the state of black baseball um and, and a lot of the topics we just discussed as it relates to youth baseball um are, are very relevant at this point um, in terms of what he wrote about and how it relates to some of what we were talking about there as well. So for those of you listening, for those of you watching, make sure to check that out as well. Um, it's a shameless plug from our managing editor, Peyton Ellison. So make sure to check that one out. We're heading towards the end here as Sam went and got, was that a dog in the back? The dog has been waiting at my door for the entire time. Aw. Well, at least you let him in. Yeah. So. yeah. At least he's enjoying himself. But anyway, yeah. another thing we didn't get to talk about re- happened today as we're recording. Uh, Drew Rasmussen came Ooh. just a few outs away from a perfect game. The first one since Felix Hernandez quite a bit ago. And oh, I'm so proud of my boy today. Rays fan being on the podcast, <laughs> I figure you get a, you give us a little in-depth about how you were feeling throughout the day today. Dude, Drew, I'm, I'm, I just want to start it off by saying that Rasmussen is really good, and the league hasn't really found out yet, except today I think they kind of did, because that guy has been just improving ever since he got to Tampa Bay. He got here last year from the Adamas trade, started out in the bullpen, and was just lights out in the bullpen. He's now into the rotation. What is it? Two point something, I don't know, sub three ERA. He's been great. His tools are nasty, fastball, cutter, slider, everything about the guy that really is just... He's going to be a future part in the Rays rotation that I'm so excited for, along with Boz, McClanahan, so many top names that I I think our future is really bright with him. But today, he was just so on point. It's it's His slider is such a plus pitch to where he's he's getting batters so righties so far out in front. He got Mullins three times on an inside slider. He was just – there was – he was – perfect today except when he got to Jorge Mateo and I kind of had the feeling you know the fastest guy kind of always has that reputation for breaking yeah perfect games and it was but yeah all I can say is Drew is going to be big important part in the race coming years yeah cool to watch that I can't wait for him to get traded his second year of arbitration (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah. Well, we know. We know what happens every time a player Enjoy gets him for a little more bit. than four mil on the phone, mm-hmm. trading him to a yeah. new team. You watch him be a Hall of Famer for like I don't know, the freaking Cardinals or something. 
Yeah, cards double magic. Yeah. But no, it was right. cool to see. And hopefully another perfect game happens soon. We've come close with a couple no hitters recently. Uh, no perfect game recently. So we will be on perfect game watch. I'm sure one will come up sooner rather than later. Just saying that John means I mean, one the, was the Dodgers brutal. have a oh. The Dodgers have taken several no hitters past the fifth inning into the sixth and seventh. Just gonna throw that out there. Mm -hmm. They definitely could, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, in, with the state of baseball currently, in terms of just offense in general, I'm not gonna put it past anyone to say, "Oh, we won't see no hit or for another perfect game for like another ten years," because we're, we're at ten years with Felix Hernandez's. Um, so it's just like I, I have a feeling we're gonna see one sooner rather than later. I, I think I Sandy do. Sandy's going to get closed a couple times, and he's. I think Sandy's got to be the pick to get it. My money's Alcantara on Cease. Dylan he has, he has the he's stamina. The like Alcantara is the stamina and like just the stuff to get it done. So Sam saying Dylan Cease is a great way to earn brownie points with. Oh no! Wow. I'm just saying I love against Dylan a random. I, you, you face the Royals or Tigers on any given Wednesday a day. afternoon. Yeah. He could just easily go in there and just quickly put up a no-no or something he has the ability to i uh, he's he's the guy I like i don't know who i'd put money on for that that's I, I i feel like we had that string of no hitters what was it two years ago it was 2021 that's what got all the yeah, sticky so last stuff. year it was the sticky stuff no hitters and it was mm -hmm. we were just i felt like every podcast we're like who's gonna throw the next one and it was all predictions and we're like oh it'll probably be a couple weeks at the earliest and then it turned into now it's like Every week at a certain point, we were doing it for a while. It was, it was hilarious. But we'll see what happens with the perfect games. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a good guess. I like Dylan Cease, though. I, I like the Dylan Cease pick there. Dylan uh, Cease, I don't think, has... Does he have the stamina to go all nine? He sure. does. He doesn't have the control to prevent the walks. Yeah. <laughs> um, one other thing I do want to talk about before we kind of get into our final segment, what to watch for. I want to get everyone's opinion on this. This week, the uh, this is in regards to Jason Hayward, who has not lived up to his contract with the Cubs, to put it lightly. He has two years remaining this year and next. The Cubs have essentially already come out and said he will not be on the team next year. So they're either going to trade him, release him, whatever they were planning to do. I don't know for sure yet. I wanted to get everyone's thoughts on how they handled that. I didn't know how to react to them being maybe they were forthright with him like i'd, I'd expect you being forthright with the player but forthright publicly like that I, I i wasn't sure how to react to that i want to see if anyone had any thought. my first thought was like is it better to be dumped and then just leave the relationship or is it better to be dumped and then stall a while for a bit knowing you're on right time and then leave it's like a dead man walking thing i don't really strange how the cubs just outright made it public to everyone as well and not just hayward i would have understood if it was just hayward that makes total sense right. the public finding out that this is going to be hayward's final year we're just going to let him play out this year and then he's gone that's just it's strange you don't see yeah. players that you know are playing with that over your head with their heads you know i mean they yeah. think <clears throat> hayward won them that 2016 series they never signed hayward I mean that. I mean, there's the whole story of his speech in Game Seven. That, that, how much do you buy that, though? Is it worth a hundred and however many million? A championship dollars? is priceless. Yes, but I. It, that feels like more of a correlation causation type thing here. You know, let the Cubs fan, fans have their narrative. Uh, you're defending the Cubs fans, and I don't know I'm, why. I'm I'm the defending, uh, I don't hate the Cubs. They're also bad. I hate the. I, I hate Fair the Cardinals. Enough. I hate the Brewers. <laughs> But the Cubs are right there with us, so I will. That's for right. NL Central Bros. That's right. I think it, it just speaks to the larger trend of more and more things are being debated in the open forum. I think yeah. the last CBA was so publicly negotiated, the lockout was so publicly negotiated that they're kind of weaponizing the public more and more often when it comes to play, like you know, players that have not lived up to things, which is weird. Cause again, it's like not really good business. Um, mm -hmm. and it's really shitty for the player as a person. Um, but I think you're seeing more and more of these things play out in a public arena in ways that 
have not really happened in the past. I think social media is a part of that, but they're also kind of seeing how it can be effective. Um, if you plant the seed that a player, you know, is one way or another, or if the team is one way or another, like, does it ultimately affect things? I don't know, but it definitely changes the course of, of discussion and yeah. something like that can. So I don't know if, I think this is something that's just going to be more and more of a thing is stuff that used to only be happening behind closed doors is getting discussed and, and used as bargaining chips and pawn pieces. And it is wild too. Like, and I think about something that happened with the White Sox this week, Johnny Cueto veteran pitcher comes out and basically says the White Sox don't have any fire behind them. Tony La Russa is asked about that. He's like, he says a bunch of things, kind of denies it. And then he, he throws in a line where he's like, that's probably something better to talk about within the clubhouse. Essentially, sound like he called out Cueto for the way he did it. But it's like, that's another example where it's like, it, it's changed so much. La Russa's managed a long time. Mm-hmm. What happens in the clubhouse stays in the clubhouse. Doesn't necessarily happen anymore. And you can debate, is it right or wrong till the cows come home? Like, that's something we can debate for hours on a podcast. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it comes down to like if he wants to say this team lacks fire, he, that's that's all he needs to do. That's that's he, he's a veteran, you, right? Like, yeah, that's fine. It's different if the rookie comes out and says it. Maybe you handle it differently. But it's like when the thirty-four-year-old veteran comes out and says that, you take it seriously and, and you don't really criticize how he's doing it publicly, you know. especially when you think back to the Herman Mercedes situation last year when he was very public about it, like. It's like, uh, it's just very weird. It, it kind of all relates into, it's very weird how things are being handled so publicly. It, it's full circle with, we started with Tatis, we end with Hayward and this La Russa thing. It, it's all being handled very publicly now. And yeah. you don't do yourself any favors as a business person for a trade value and B, just how people view your organization in general. Like who's going to want to come and sign a big contract with you if, if you're not performing, you're telling everyone after you're six of seven, yeah, you're not going to be here next year. So it's like, that, that's the kind of weird stuff. To, to Melvin's credit, uh, it was public. It was made public that he had a call with Tatis and he did mm-hmm. not, did not talk about what it was discussed. And he said, you know, that he, but he pivoted. He, he talked about how it's was like, you know, there's, there's protocols for when players get hit. We're just going to treat this like an hurt. Get, they, you know, we're going to treat this like an injury. So, you know, Maybe, maybe comparing two old school uh, managers, purpose, and yeah. one of them, one of them, I think handled the situation better. Yeah. I'm going to say it like when was the last time you heard something out of Cleveland's clubhouse? It's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. What's yeah. the worst? When's the last time you heard something out of Cleveland? <laughs> <laughs> like I just looked Rock up and, roll, day, baby. and they were in first place. <laughs> like that's what Cleveland. I hate Cleveland. <laughs> It's a, and and it's because they're so good at what they do. Don't get me wrong; they are incredibly good at what they do and how they do it, and it drives me nuts as a White yeah. Sox fan. As a baseball fan, I respect it. Well, like I feel like there's been a distinct lack of Astros drama. I feel like Dusty Baker and like Terry Francona they've those cleaned those, it up. Yeah, those are no, well, they got rid of some. They're what Tony Larusa was supposed to be for the White Sox. It, it's interesting to see, like you, and it's it's not like. And I think it's important. It's not like, oh, it's all old school. It's not all old school managers at all. It's you're seeing old school managers around the league succeed in the way they're doing things. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just, and people are like, and when people criticize Tony LaRusso, it's like, oh, you're being ageist. No, I, there are a lot of old school managers in baseball right now who are succeeding and doing very well. Like it's, it's not an age thing. It's, it's, it goes well beyond that in how things have been handled. Yeah, but like the Mets, <clears throat> like at the Mets, the Iron Buck Show, Walter. Guardians, yep. like all these like old school managers work, just not Larusa. It just has to. It has to be something where you react to how things change over time. And, and again, it, that's that full circle thing. Tatis to the end here with Hayward. Like it, it's how you handle the game changing in front of you. Now we're being more public with things. How do you react to it as an individual? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's bring it home. Our final segment, what to watch for. Each of our wonderful writers here will give their opinion on maybe a player, maybe a series, maybe a team that they think, hey, you should be watching out for them this week. And here's why. So we'll start with the veteran, Sam. You're what to watch for. Uh, 
I would like to watch Aaron Judge hit more home runs, personally. That's fair. Aaron Judge will be a one want, to watch for, for the I next want, month and a half. I want 62. What's he at now? 40... 47, I think. Do you think he gets it? It's the same question I have about Pujols. Do you think Pujols gets 700? I think Pujols won't get 700, but I think he gets 697 to be A-Rod. Okay. But then, <laughs> I hope so. Now, do you think Judge gets 62? Judge getting 62. Interesting. Like, I, I don't think there's really much. He's going to get there. All it's right. just a matter of how long it takes him. Hmm. So, Aaron Judge, Sam's what to watch for. Tevi, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I know you're going to roll your eyes because I'm a homer, but Dustin May's coming back sometime this week, potentially. That's exciting, though. That's it's very cool exciting. Uh, yeah, he's. Uh, I was look. I was looking at his stats. He's uh, got a 193 in 14 innings right now. I don't know if that includes today's outing where he struck out 10 uh, in five Bruce innings. Gunn. Threw an immaculate Ten, inning too, and threw How an immaculate many? inning. <laughs> no, one uh, cares five innings. So yeah, uh, it was a uh, ten strikeouts, one run, and five innings with an immaculate. Oh, that inning. guy's so good. Now one of his immaculates may have been a real good frame drop, but <laughs> it was still <laughs> it was still an immaculate inning, and it was still nice. pretty great. Uh, I think he's ready, especially with Kershaw going down. We're going to need it. Brian Pepio is going to be uh, stepping into Kershaw's place for the moment. Pepio is great, but. My God, Dustin May. I we're ready. We're ready for Big Red. And he's Code a red alert. He is very. He is very much. Love yes, he has. He has <laughs> a lot of red. Represent. <laughs> he's very. He's also really fun to watch. Um, yeah. He's a very bouncy, and the the hair goes like the flow is un as is unbelievable. He skips over the third baseline when he gets someone to strike out. He kind of pops up in place, and he just has a lot of energy, and it's really fun to watch. And you know. He's real. He's real, real good. I'm sure Manny Machado is not happy he's coming back because man, he he he's got ridiculous run, ridiculous run yeah. on his pitches. Like sinker, yeah. That his sinker, his slider, yeah. like everything. It just, it just, it's like, it's like Bugs Bunny throws. It's ridiculous. It is so fun. big, so, big. Excitement. Aaron Judge, Dustin May, Sam. I've got um kind of along the same line as Tavi. Uh, Two pitchers coming back from injury that are huge names, and I think it's the reason why teams don't add at the deadline is because they know that these type of guys are coming back. One, Cardinals have Jack Flaherty coming back. I know Jack Flaherty's had his run of issues the last couple of years. His consistency has really kind of struggled. He struggled with it. But they're going to be getting him back really soon. Add him to that Cardinals team, and they could suddenly surge past. I mean, they're already a bit up on the Brewers, but they could surge past the Brewers with a guy like him. And another guy who I think many have forgotten about, Mike Soroka. He's beginning his rehab assignment um, tomorrow, I think. Is that still and, from the Achilles tear? He, sorry, what was that? Was that still from, is that still from the Achilles tear in 2020? Mm -hmm. or just Yeah, like yeah. He's been yeah. out that long. Oh, and wow. He's going to be back um, a bit early September, but give Atlanta a postseason arm like him, that they're they're, they're already looking really good. Atlanta put you know. put a Soroka in that postseason rotation; they are going to be flying. That Those two names coming back from the from the IL are going to be huge for their teams. That NL postseason is going to be electric. It yeah. is. I know it's gonna be a fun this year. I know so many good teams. Like so it, many. The teams. NL is so fun because the good teams are just so good. It's really yeah. flipped as well. I remember when the AL was had that stretch where it had the 108 win Red Sox, Yankees, and Astros were really good that year. It's kind of flipped now because I mean, you have the Mets, Padres, Dodgers, Braves, all these teams that are just so good. Yeah, and then watch St. Louis randomly make a World Series run. And of course, St. Louis will <laughs> find their way in, but. No, we don't me, talk about the Cardinals and Dodger. Well, <laughs> oh, oh, I can, I can imagine that, yeah. <laughs> um, and then for me, I'm going to stick in the AL Central. Um, Al Avila was fire. We didn't get to get to. We didn't get to talk about it. Oh, that's right. Al Avila was fired. Uh, well, they parted ways in Detroit. Whoever comes in has a me mess to fix. The, the the team's in an interesting spot where you have a lot of talent. But you also have a lot of talent that is lacking from this team. And it's going to be very interesting. Whoever comes in, they'll have a GM who's willing to spend, um, but, or excuse me, they'll have an owner that's willing to spend for the GM. But 
it's going to be a very difficult situation. So I'm going to keep watching. This might be a multi-week what to watch for, but I'm going to be looking for who they decide to bring in. Because something could... tells me that it could be a Rays, Dodgers, or Brewers former. Probably some good working the front office here. with them. Yeah. They they always target those type of guys. Probably a good yeah. thing to put money on. I mean, to be yeah. fair, Dombrowski should have won a World Series with them. Right. That was one well, of the great failed teams. It's just it's very weird to see an a um GM get hired mid rebuild like this. Like they, they were supposedly in the next year or two coming up. And, and oh, I think it was Torkelson ahead. and just how everything was kind of mishandled mm-hmm. and how just it all fell apart. I mean, he was quoted at the start of the year where saying the rebuild is kind of over, you know? This is yeah. the first Tigers competitive Detroit team you're seeing in a while. And it just, and it just wasn't ready. Face, face. Yeah, so, no offense at all. It, it'll be, yeah, and then spending big on bias. Like, it, it'll be very interesting to see what changes with a new GM and who they bring in. What do you um, think Dan Campbell knows about baseball? Dan Campbell, dude. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Bring that to the front office of a baseball team. That would be wild. But no, that's what I'll be looking towards is, you know, kind of who's the next one to kind of help that direction for the Tigers. But for now, that's going to do it for us. So first of all, thank you to everyone who listens. As always, we appreciate your support. Diamond underscore digest is the Twitter handle. Diamond dot digest is the Instagram handle. Diamond dash digest dot com is the website. I did a great job setting these all up, keeping everything consistent. It's Truly. just worse code. It's fine. Di- or dashes, dots, underscores, whatever we want to be. Um, make sure to check us out there. We'll have plenty of articles coming out this week like we do every week. Plenty of good stuff on all of our social media. Sunday Night Watch Party, which is our Sunday Night Baseball stream that we do. Apparently, they did the 999 Challenge. I haven't gotten to see the replay of it yet. I'm already concerned, but I'm sure the video will be everywhere. So make sure to check that out. Excuse me, check that out as well. Uh, make sure to follow our writers on Twitter along with the account. I forgot to put my Twitter this time. I'll yes, do Sam, next. where can we find you? What's your oh, Twitter handle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine is uh, at Samuel Hoffman. It's like my name, but just with Samuel. So all, when all I, I think I pronounced your name completely wrong, Hoffman. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry. I was not even close earlier. Don't so worry. I'll stick to first names on the outro. Solidarity. Here. No one ever gets mine right either. So, you're fine. Yeah. so I'm going to stick with first names for our outro. For the Sam duo and Tavi, this is Jordan Zaski signing off. Take care, everyone. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your week, and we will talk to you next week. Take care. Go baseball.